Hey everyone, we are here for our last class of the week. Um, you made it, you've gone through a whole week of this now. Um, I would love to hear how this went for you. Um, obviously we're you know, still playing around with a few things and we're still getting used to schedules, but um, we'd love to hear how this first week went for you. Um, in terms of stuff upcoming, um, thinking about, you know, ways to keep you accountable um, if, if you need that push or if you want that push. Um, and as far as keeping folks organized and on top of their schedules, um, what do you need? What can I do for you? And um, how can I be of help in getting you situated that way and keeping you on top of stuff? I know it's kind of tricky when we've got um, no real daily schedule and when we're you know so far out of our routines but um, my hope is that we can find a way to keep everybody you know at least feeling good about their schedule um, go ahead and if you're feeling up for it i've uploaded some uh kind of interesting and informative resources to our COVID 19 discussion board um again this you know is no pressure i do want to give those folks an opportunity um to opt out of it who feel like they need that space um and would like it, maybe at least one space that isn't talking about this uh this current outbreak. Um, but if you are feeling up for it, um, there's some interesting stuff there. I've posted some links to that podcast Sawbones that I've shared with you in the past. Um, and so I hope you find it enjoyable. Um, we're, we're going to originally have a quiz this first week. Um, I think we're going to move that off to next week though. Um, I think that's gonna open up Monday. That's the plan for now. So that's uh, Monday the 7th. And then it'll be due that Thursday to give you a couple of days to get on top of it. Um, also, your TA Nano is here. I just heard him meowing. He may or may not make an appearance this video. Um, it is kind of late here right now. Well, it's not that late. It's about 9 p.m. Eastern time. It has been a long day here and uh, so I'm tired. You're tired. We're all tired, but we are going to do photosynthesis and it's going to be awesome. So Let's see here. So last time we spoke, um, I sort of left you with this primer of, you know, thinking about photosynthesis as an umbrella term that encompasses two distinct um, metabolic processes that occur in plants. And so these two processes um, we refer to as either light dependent, so they require sunlight in order to in order to work, um, or they are light independent. So this, is, this part of the um, this part of photosynthesis is also sometimes called the Calvin cycle. You may have heard of it before. You may have learned a little bit about it before. Um, it's pretty infamous, but we will be looking at a, you know, pared down version of that for the purposes of our course. But so the light dependent um, reactions are, you know, catalyzed or facilitated by sunlight. So um, there's an input of energy um, from the sun. We call that photo energy, um, the prefix photo meaning light. And so that uh, sunlight, that photo energy, um, through this process is converted to stored chemical energy um, in the form of ATP um, and NADPH, which get sent to the Calvin cycle. And so the Calvin cycle's job is to use that energy, use the NADPH, use that, AP, that ATP, um, as well as an input of carbon dioxide to produce ultimately sugar and then uh, produce the molecules that will go back into the light dependent reactions to uh, begin the process again. So this is cyclical in nature. Um, it doesn't really have a beginning or an end. It occurs as a cycle and can therefore be started or stopped at sort of any point. Um, so I guess in general, if we look at this if we look at this uh, reaction, we can sort of boil it down into this formula. So we would say that in photosynthesis, we like very, very generally have like sunlight plus plant equals sugar, right? And so um, if we wanna get a little bit more into it, we would say that, okay, if we combine uh, carbon dioxide, water and the light energy in the form of photons, more on that in a moment, 
then the end result, the yield from that equation that we get is uh, sugar. So that is this C6H12O6 is how you would say that. And then we wind up also with oxygen. So these are the two products of photosynthesis overall. And so this equation is going to be really important to know. So I do expect you to know um, how many molecules of carbon dioxide, how many molecules of water um, enter the reaction. And because if we look at this, these numbers add up. So the way we would interpret this is we would say that in six molecules of carbon dioxide, in truth, this is written in a way that's slightly confusing because it doesn't show these numbers as um, subscripts. And so that's a little bit tricky um, to read this way, but I did like this diagram, so I just used it. Um, but so what we would say is that um, because this two here is next to the oxygen, that means that in one molecule of CO2, carbon dioxide, in one molecule of CO2, we have two, atoms of oxygen. We've seen this before with water. And so in one molecule of water, we would say that because the two is next to the H, the hydrogen, in one molecule of water, we have two molecule or two atoms of hydrogen. If we look at the sugar, the same thing. So we would say here that there are six atoms of carbon, 12 atoms of hydrogen and six atoms of oxygen in a single molecule of sugar. And so that tells us what the numbers to the right of you know, these uh, atomic symbols are, but this doesn't tell us anything about what this number to the left indicates. And the left uh, number indicates how many molecules do we have? So in this case, we would say that there are six molecules of CO2, six molecules of H2O, one molecule of C6H12O6, or sugar, and six molecules of O2. And so if I were to ask you how many um, atoms of uh, carbon dioxide, or sorry, how many atoms of carbon enter uh, photosynthesis? Well, why don't you go ahead and pause and try to figure it out real quick on your own. But if I, I could also ask you how many atoms of uh, oxygen enter photosynthesis, right? Maybe think about that one for a moment also. And so, we, the way we would determine this is we would say, okay, well, if I've got six atoms of carbon dioxide, then I would then, and I know that in one molecule of carbon dioxide, there is only one carbon atom and there are two carb, uh, there are two oxygen atoms. Then I would say that for every, for six molecules of that, there are six carbons and six times two oxygen atoms. So we would say that six carbon atoms enter photosynthesis and 12 oxygen atoms enter. But actually that's not even really true because if we accounted for the water also, we would see that you know for every one molecule of H2O, we have two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. So we would say six times one, right? Because there's only one oxygen atom in each molecule of water. So six times one is six, and then six times two is 12. So really we would have, what is that? Six times two, so 18, we would have 18 um, atoms of oxygen starting photosynthesis. And you can figure out, you can figure that out with any of these, um, but knowing that um, that notation is, is quite useful as we move forward. So I guess before we can look at the molecular process itself, we have to establish just a couple of more, a couple more pieces of anatomy. And so thinking about plants, right, I told you that part of what comes in, uh, part of the pro uh, reactants in photosynthesis are carbon dioxide. And so 
the way we get carbon dioxide is um, through gas exchange within the plant. And so the way the plant is capable of conducting gas exchange, so intake of uh, CO2 to conduct um, photosynthesis, and then the release of oxygen at the end of photosynthesis is through these structures called stoma or stomata. And these are little like pores in the leaf. They're like almost like pores in your skin, you can sort of imagine. And there's, there's a little bit more to them than we're going to explore um, for our purposes, but um, what we need to know, what's relevant to us right now, is that the stoma um, are openings in the leaf that allow the leaf to absorb carbon dioxide and release oxygen. And so of interest to us also is a structure called the cuticle, which actually isn't labeled on this particular diagram, but the cuticle would be found as the outermost layer of the leaf. So the cuticle is kind of like this uh, waxy layer. It's pretty thin. Well, actually it could be thick depending on the species of plant. Um, but the cuticle is going to be this kind of waxy layer that works to maintain homeostasis for the leaf by preventing water loss through the leaves. And if we remember that it's waxy, it's fairly intuitive how that works, right? Think of it like a sheet of saran wrap over the top of the leaf. That sheet of saran wrap is gonna prevent the water loss from occurring. Therefore, it's going to prevent that plant from drying out and from losing all of its water through the leaves and through the stomata and just evaporating right out of the cells. Another thing that we need to understand before we can uh, before we can get into the mechanisms of photosynthesis is light. Now we've we've actually talked about this before a little bit, um, but we're going to touch on it again uh, here and now. So what's important and relevant about light? Um, as you know, I, I guess the the physics of light that we care about is that it behaves as both a wave and a particle. And so that's kind of a weird thing to wrap your head around, but it behaves as a wave in a way that we can actually quantify and measure. So I, if I recall correctly, we've spoken at least once about this concept of wavelength and uh, different energetics of, of light. And so what we call a wavelength is essentially when light shines through a prism, and they've got this really cool tool that can measure this. When light shines through a prism and creates these waves, right, that they, that they graph out and, and test for and measure, the distance between crests of those waves, so we have like the hills or the we call crests and the valleys we call troughs. So the distance between crests is what we call the wavelength, the, just the length of the wave, literally. So the rule here is larger wavelength, greater distance between waves. We would say that that light has less energy. It's not traveling as rapidly. The inverse is true also. So if we have closer crests, shorter wavelength, that light is traveling much faster Therefore, it is much more energetic. Now, I told you also that light behaves as a particle, and that particle um, we call photons, which is going to become relevant really, really soon um, in just a moment here. So hang, hang on to that and just keep that in your pocket for a moment. The parts of light that we can see um, live on the visible light spectrum here, which if we look all the way at one end, um, we would say that the, the end that my cursor is on, where gamma rays are, this is where like the really high energy wavelengths are. And if we go down to the opposite end of the spectrum, this is where all the really, really low energy uh, wavelengths are. So we've got things like radio waves and not labeled here, but like microwaves are there. The visible light spectrum is right over here, just under UV. So that tells us that the visible light spectrum, the, the light that we can actually see with our human eyes is less energetic than UV 
uh, wavelengths. And so in that spectrum, different colors contain, or what we perceive as different colors, contain different uh, energy levels of light also in different wavelengths. And so if we go look on one end, we would say like, okay, over by violet, that end of the visible light spectrum would have shorter wavelengths, higher energy than light on the opposite side of the visible spectrum. So like red lights or orange or yellow or green, for example. And so also just a quick refresher, looking at the chloroplasts, we talked about this in our last video. So chloroplasts, again, they have a lot of things that we're used to seeing, but the part that we care about right now, the part that we're gonna focus on are these, um, these grana, these stacks of thylakoids and their membranes full of chlorophyll. So this diagram it looks like a lot. It's kind of busy. And my apologies for the wonky arrows here. I actually <laughs> drew those in because I couldn't quite find a, a diagram that, that looked the way I wanted it to. So I improvised a little. Okay, so I told you that photosynthesis occurs in the membrane of the thylakoid. And it occurs there because that's where chlorophyll is stored. And so the actual structure that houses chlorophyll is what we call a photosystem. And so there are two photosystems, two types of photosystem that we can find within the thylakoid membrane. And so we call them photosystems two and photosystems one. And they go in that order. Photosystem two comes first, photosystem one comes last. I know the naming of this stuff is absolutely ridiculous, um, but they actually were named that way uh, in order that they were discovered. So uh, photosystem one, though it is the second in the sequence, is actually the first one that was discovered of the two. So that's something. So the, these photosystems are what we'd call a transmembrane protein. So these are, um, are protein is maybe a slightly misnomer. Let's call it a transmembrane molecule. And so something that is transmembrane means that it is embedded into the membrane. It is embedded into the thylakoid membrane, which again is constructed of this phospholipid bilayer, just as we're used to seeing in any eukaryotic cell that we've seen before. And so this, this transmembrane molecule, this photosystem, we'll start with photosystem two, is home to lots of molecules of chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is uh, what we'd call a pigment molecule. So um, broadly, they are responsible for color. But the reason they're responsible for color is because they are capable of absorbing and reflecting light. And so this is exactly what happens here. So the sun is going to, you know, hit the leaf, right? Sun touches the leaf, everything's cool. And then the, when the, the photons of the, of the light wave, those uh, units of light energy, the photons, um, hit the chlorophyll molecule inside the photosystem, it triggers this chain reaction where the photons energy gets transferred to the electrons of the chlorophyll molecule. And so this causes the electrons of the chlorophyll molecule to become energized or excited. We would say that the electrons have reached an excited state, but really they've just become full of energy from that light energy touching it. And so when that electron becomes energized, it then starts this chain reaction of transferring all this extra energy all the way down the line. So light hits this first chlorophyll molecule, transfers its extra energy over here, down to the next one, to the next, to the next, and then eventually working its way to uh, the inside of the photosystem. And so that electron is then going to be sort of slingshotted up to this piece right here, which I don't love the way it's labeled, but you know, this is what we've got. And so the 
energized electron is going to be sort of launched up to this space that we call the electron acceptor. And so when it reaches the electron receptor, it's going to begin on this second phase of the journey. So it reaches the electron acceptor, and I'm gonna to try to switch to laser pointer here with my cursor because my cursor does keep uh, sort of vanishing. I hope that's easier to view. So at the electron acceptor, the excited electrons are then going to be shot across the plasma membrane. And so they do this by sort of hopping from acceptor molecule to acceptor molecule. That's what these circles are here. They're acceptor molecule, they're like landing pads for the excited electron. And so as the electron is sort of hopping down, it, it is going to lose energy and that loss of energy is going to be transferred to this guy here, this protein. So this is what we'd call a transmembrane protein. And this guy's job is only to pull hydrogen atoms in. So to orient ourselves, again, in case it wasn't totally clear, up here, this blue is gonna be the stroma of the chloroplast. This more greeny beige spot is gonna be the inside of the thylakoid. So this is the membrane here. And the electrons hopping from acceptor to acceptor, losing energy, and that lost energy is used to power this transmembrane protein to pull protons, hydrogen atoms, from the stroma to the inside of the thylakoid. This portion here, this portion here that I'm circling around is what we call the electron transport chain or the ETC. This is super, super important. And we will see it again when we get into cellular respiration pretty soon. The mechanism is fairly similar. Um, so this is something that you will absolutely see again. So we are transporting electrons over and using them to pull to power this uh, doorway we could think of it as to pull protons from the stroma to the thylakoid space. So now the electrons here on this final electron acceptor and now it's lost some energy. It's not quite as energetic as it was back in photosystem two. And so it heads over here to photosystem one where it can become re-energized from a second chain reaction of sunlight hitting chlorophyll and then sending that energy all the way down until it can re-energize those electrons. And as those electrons make their way up to the electron acceptor of photosystem one, they then get picked up by a molecule that we call NADP+. That's how you'd say that, NADP+. And so the process here is kind of interesting. So all of these electrons are essentially getting sent here to photosystem one. And when they do, their job is to essentially get scooped up by NADP+. And so this is a process that we call reduction. And this is kind of counterintuitive and a little bit tricky because when we say reduction in chemistry, what we really mean is a reduction of charge of the molecule. So we don't, so even though NADP plus is gaining an electron, it's, lo it's lowering its overall charge. It's going from NADP plus to NADPH. It has gained an electron. It has gone from having a net positive charge to being neutralized with an electron. And so now we call it NADP+. What ha the whole purpose of all of this is ultimately to pull protons into the thylakoid space. So bring them from the stroma to the thylakoid space. And so when this happens, when we, wind, when we pull a ton of protons into the thylakoid space, 
what we wind up doing is creating a really high concentration of protons, really high concentration of proton ions. And remember, we call them ions because they have overall a net imbalance of charge. They are positive overall. And so the transmembrane protein here that they got pulled in through, the thing about this doorway is that it's a one-way street. You can pull protons in, but you can't send them back out. The only way out of the thylakoid space is through this molecule, ATP synthase. So this is another transmembrane protein, but this one's special, and I'm leaving it on this diagram because it's a little bit more detailed. We'll hop back to the other in just a moment. Your TA is joining us uh, to explain further. I guess maybe I'm not doing a good job. There he is. Anyway, so ATP synthase is a special transmembrane protein whose job it is to facilitate chemical reactions that create ATP. So remember, ATP is the unit of cellular energy that is used to power a cell. So the only way out, if this uh, red box represents ATP synthase, the only way out is through here. So now we've got a high ion concentration on one side and a low ion concentration on the other. This should look familiar because we talked about osmosis quite a bit. And by now, you should know that, that concentration gradients, when they are formed this way, will always be set up so that the solutes will move from areas of high concentration to low concentration. And so in this case, if the only doorway out is through ATP synthase and the ions, the solute in this case, the protons, all want to move from the area where it is highly concentration, concentrated to where it is low concentrated, it's going to go through the ATP synthase. And when it does, there's a really interesting chemical reaction that occurs because when we go through ATP synthase, this little piece on top, this like messy bun of the ATP synthase is kind of like a turnstile, like you would see like when you're taking the subway or something. And it actually turns with the energy of protons passing through it. And when it turns, it joins a phosphate ion and that molecule ADP. So ATP is the final product. ATP's full name is adenosine triphosphate. So adenosine is similar again to adenine, like we saw in your nucleic acids, tri meaning three, and phosphate is like phosphate groups. And so ADP is its cousin, so adenosine diphosphate, so that adenine analog plus uh, two phosphates. So the job of ATP synthase is to add on that third phosphate group to AD ADP, creating ATP. When we are doing this process when we've got all these um, positively charged uh, protons hanging out on the inside of the thylakoid and then fewer on the outside. One thing that um, is useful to know as we go forward is that this creates also an imbalance of pH. We haven't talked a ton about pH. Um, we'll, we'll revisit it a little bit later, but what is, um, Important to know for now is that in general, when you have a space that has a high amount of hydrogen ions, that generally means a more acidic pH. Um, so a lower number on the pH scale compared to having fewer um, hydrogen, ion, hydrogen ions or protons would give you a, a higher pH or a less acidic or more basic, we would also say. And so now that we've produced this ATP and uh, the NADPH, not pictured here, 
Now we're ready to move off to the Calvin cycle. And so these are our light independent reactions. So they don't occur with the use of sunlight. In fact, they only occur indirectly, I guess, because of sunlight. The products of the light dependent reactions are what's going to power the Calvin cycle here. And so we've got three main, uh, I guess, phases to the Calvin cycle. And this is, again, a very pared down version of the Calvin cycle. Depending on which sources you're looking at, you may find um, you know, some really complex stuff. I'm going to spare you all the, uh, the gory details there, but it gets, it gets quite complex. But this is what you need to know for our purposes. Um, and so the three stages that we're focusing on are fixation, um, also called carb carboxylation, um, reduction, and the regeneration of Ruby P. So Ruby P is a, a carbon-based molecule that is important for this cycle. And so what happens at the, I guess, the start, remembering that this is a cycle and like start and end don't really mean anything. Um, at the start of the Calvin cycle, we have carbon dioxide entering. And the way carbon dioxide enters, again, is going to be through the stoma or stomata. And so when carbon dioxide uh, enters through the stomata, it's going to react with that molecule Ruby P. Now Ruby P is made up of five carbons itself. And so when it reacts with carbon dioxide, it reacts with that extra carbon. Now it forms a six carbon molecule. That six carbon molecule is then sort of quickly uh, split in half into two three carbon molecules that we call 3PG. So 3PG is the molecule that's going to enter um, the phase that we call reduction. And so this is when our ATP and NADPH are going to start to become important. So there's going to be a series of chemical reactions here that involve uh, using the energy of ATP to um, and taking electrons from NADPH that are eventually going to convert this molecule 3PG to G3P, which are two different things, even though it sounds like the letters are just rearranged, and I guess they are, but they're two different things. <laughs> so now that we've used up the energy from ATP, by cleaving off one of those phosphate groups, now we've created ADP again. And when we donated the electrons from NADPH, now we've created NADP plus again. And both of those can be recycled and return to the light reactions, return to the thylakoids in order to be reused. One of those G3Ps that is produced is going to become a template for the glucose that is produced at the end of the Calvin cycle. And so once that glucose molecule leaves, it's labeled here as hexose, it sort of gets kicked out to the side, we're going to enter the last stage um, that we call regeneration, specifically the regeneration of Ruby P. And so, uh, so the remaining G3P molecules that we have left, remember these are made up of three carbons. These are gonna be used to recreate a molecule of Ruby P. But in order to do this, we have to use energy input from ATP once again. And so once Ruby P has been created, has been recreated, the cycle can begin again with more, with more carbon dioxide entering the system. And so I know that's quite a lot and it can feel really dense. Um, I've included another video from another resource that goes over the Calvin cycle specifically. Um, please come see me if you're having any issues with uh, making heads or tails of this. Again, I know it's quite a lot of information. This is something that you know, we'd, we'd normally spend probably a couple of class periods on. And so um, certainly wade through it at your own pace. Um, come see me. I would love to see you. And um, 
certainly let me know if you have any questions. Let's uh, start using that discussion board and start playing around with it and uh, getting used to this new online structure. I hope you're all doing really well. I really look forward to uh, hearing from some of you. And in the meantime, have a great evening and I will talk to you soon.